Hi, my name is Hassan Sorrells. I'm the CEO, founder, and head facilitator and trainer at Human Services Consulting and Training. Uh, we know that now, in a time of COVID-19, that there are some challenges that are arising for individuals who are now engaged in remote work in ways that they weren't engaged in remote work before. COVID-19 as a pandemic has swept across our country and it has forced employers, managers, supervisors, and even workers to think about how they are going to work remotely and what remote leadership and leading remote teams actually looks like. And so today, I'd like to explore that topic a little bit with you. I'd like to do that in a very short and succinct fashion, give you some big ideas, and then maybe send you home with some tips for how to engage better in these areas. As I said before, my name is Hassan Sorrells. You can connect with Human Services Consulting and Training on Facebook. You can connect with us on LinkedIn. You can connect with us on Twitter and right here on YouTube. Please also check out our website at hsconsultingandtraining.com. Look at our list of workshops, all of which can be delivered remotely, all of which can be made to fit your needs while you're working at home. We integrate with Zoom, WebEx, also Skype for Business, and any of those other remote tools that you're using in order to get information to your employees, your managers, and your supervisors during this time of rapid change. All right, when we, get, when we think about how we train people remotely, when we think about how we even engage with people remotely on remote teams, we have to think about a few things. We have to think about the size of our team. It's not just a simple matter of taking 50 people who used to work in an office together and just moving them onto Zoom or moving them onto Skype or even moving them onto WebEx and then all of a sudden just spinning up meetings and taking up everybody's time. The second thing that we have to think of, so number of people is the first thing that we're going to discuss today. Number of people. How many people do you have on your team that are going to work remote? Some organizations right now are in a hybrid mode where part of your workforce is still back in the office and part of your workforce is at home. And based upon whichever state you're in or international area that you might be in, watching this video from, you may be inside of a hybrid model or you might be at a full remote model or you might be in a furlough or layoff model. And you don't wanna let those workers go to waste. You don't wanna let them just hang around. So, we're going to talk about how many people do we have to manage and what does that actually look like. The second thing to think about if you're a manager or a supervisor or a leader of people who is now having to lead them remotely is what are the number of distractions that are just sort of built into our day? Look, um, meetings are a distraction. Those little touches at the coffee spot in your workplace are a distraction. Me walking over a piece of paper from one side of the building to another side of the building is a distraction. All of these little moments during the day eat up time and you don't really think too much about it except when your team isn't there. That's when you begin thinking about it. That's when it begins to be a real problem, particularly if team members are at home, if school children are at home with those team members, and now they're in a moment and they're in a mode where they have to take care of children. Maybe they have to take care of somebody who's been impacted by COVID-19 or novel coronavirus. And they're also in a space where they've got to get work done. Now distractions are going to a premium and you're paying them via Slack or some other messaging tool, or they're hearing their mobile phone ring or they're hearing their webcam ring saying that now they've got a Zoom meeting, now they've got a Skype meeting, now they have to go to work. And people who have had a lot of trouble navigating just the general distractions of the workplace may need help being led through navigating the general distractions of the workplace now being home. So we're going to talk about that. The other thing that we're going to address today is the number of and type of meetings. One of the most amazing things to happen in this period of time during the spread of this pandemic has been the idea whose time has come that maybe meetings should really be emails. But what does that mean for you as a manager? What does that mean for you as a leader? What does that mean for you with working with people who 
may have okay writing skills in the workplace but not strong ones or who may have had a low level of writing involved in their job or involved in their position and now they have a higher level of writing involved and now they have to write more emails they have to engage in more written correspondence and they may be uncomfortable with that they may not know how to drive through that and thus may have trouble navigating this new work environment this new remote work environment lastly and this seems like a lot but this is one of the most important things we're going to address sort of the number of ways you lead yourself. As a manager or leader going into this new environment, right, this new world of leading remote teams, you may find yourself even challenged by working at home, working with people who may have the coronavirus, or you may have to care for folks who are sick or ill caring for children, right? Caring for other people who, you know, may not be able to care for themselves while also making sure that you're still doing work to bring in revenues into your home, to bring in income into your home, bring in cash into your home. How do you lead yourself as a manager or supervisor now becomes even more important because in a hierarchical structure that's obvious where you go to work, it can become really non-obvious really quickly about how you lead yourself. So we'll quickly go through these areas, and we'll talk a little bit about all of them today. So let me erase this welcome sign, because I think we've all been welcomed. Let me get this out of here, all right? <clears throat> and in going through my introduction, I kind of didn't mention a little bit, I didn't really talk too much about my background. So I have, a, I, as the CEO of Human Services Consulting and Training, I founded this company seven years ago, um, and we deliver in-person, on-site training to individuals um, and, of course, to businesses and groups. We're still available to do that for groups of 10 or smaller, but usually we did it with groups of 30 or more. So obviously, you know, our model has changed over time and in, in, the, in the space of this new world that we are now going into, at least for the next few months, you're going to be seeing a lot of us live streaming out and creating videos of this type of content partially to show you what it is that we do, but also partially to show you and to demonstrate for you just how easy it is to set up a remote training for yourself and to lead your team remotely if you have minimal presentation or pitching skills even, right? So I wanna talk about the content, right? I wanna talk about a couple of these ideas that I put up on the board. So let's start off with this one first. Number of people. There are a few things to consider when you're leading people remotely, right? So how many people do you have on your team? Right? If you're in a hybrid model, right? If you're working both at the office and you have some folks working at home, or if you're in a fully remote model, it could be really difficult to navigate this and manage this shuffling and, and, and battling through different priorities, uh, moving people around, maybe people um, are sick or ill, or maybe you've limited the number of people that you can allow into your facility for health reasons, right? Then managing the number of people and understanding exactly how many people you have on the team divides into two groups. How many of them are essential and how many of them are non-essential? Now, if you work in a public sector environment or work for a public sector organization, this decision is probably already made for you. And of course, if you're in a larger organization, this decision is probably made by executives and managers and other folks in meetings. But if you're in a small or medium-sized business, as a leader right now, you may be having to make this decision immediately. Who's essential to the daily business functions, who can stay on site, and who's non-essential, who has to go off site? and how quickly do we have to spin up solutions for these folks. Number of people is something to consider when you're thinking about working with folks remotely. The second thing to think about is what are their roles? What do these people do, right? What do they provide during the day? When you're talking about roles and responsibilities, in particular for leaders, it can get sort of amorphous or academic. And a lot of us look at positions as the driver for what people's roles are, but we know that there's a gap, very often a large one, between what 
people actually do and what is on the paper that says they should do. What are their roles? Can their roles be done at home? Or are their roles critical and they need to have an office component because of the nature of security, the nature of the roles they are providing, the nature of the work they're doing? Or is it something where, hey, if we really brought it down to brass tacks and many organizations out there are making this decision, even as I speak, we can really just send these folks home. The dynamic, right, between what are their roles and how many folks are on the team then comes to play really in the third thing to consider, which is where are they working from? Everybody doesn't have a home, right? And with public spaces, uh, co-op spaces, public Wi-Fi spaces, now being closed to the public, severely limiting their hours, or limiting the number of people who can be in those spaces, you now don't have workers that are going to be going to Starbucks and hanging out, right? Or going to McDonald's and hanging out and using their free Wi-Fi. Instead, you've got workers who genuinely, legitimately need to be in a space where they need to work but it can't be a community space, and they may not have the function to be able to navigate that dynamic from a home or an apartment. So thinking about those folks' spaces and where they are is hugely important. A couple of suggestions for you when you're thinking about people and where they're working from. Do they have a home or an apartment? And is that a steady spot? Like do they have a room that they can set up in of some kind? Or Worst comes to worst, even a corner they can set up in, right? Helping them navigate this will reduce some of the anxiety that workers may have of, oh my gosh, I got to work from home now, and I have no idea how to do this. I have no idea where I'm going to set this up. I've got like this person living here, and I've got this person here, and I've got this person there, and I have no space. Or if you need larger equipment to run a remote uh, working situation, if they need desks or complete computers, right? Everybody doesn't have a laptop. Everybody doesn't have a Wi-Fi enabled laptop in their home. Everybody doesn't even have a desktop computer, as odd as it may seem for you as a manager or supervisor. Everybody may not have that in their home. And so how will you as the organization, you as the leader, lead on providing those resources for individuals when they don't have them? And a lot of this can be driven also by the nature of the work that they do. So for instance, if you are leading people who are more blue collar oriented or maybe a blue collar, white collar hybrid, they may never have thought of getting a desktop or getting a laptop or getting a tablet. You may have to provide those in order for individuals to engage in remote work effectively. So these are some things to think about when you're thinking about the number of people on the team. Number one, how many people are on the team? Are they essential or non-essential and dividing up those functions? Number two, what are their roles? Are they needed to be in the home or can they be in an, a hybrid office situation? And then of course, where are they working from? Do they have a space in their house to work from? These seem like minimal things to think about, but right from the beginning, if you consider the number of people and you consider these answers to these questions, you can reduce worker anxiety. And as a leader right now, our biggest roles, our biggest jobs are to reduce panic. Our biggest jobs are to make sure that the people know that we know, or at least have a general idea of what's going on. Our job is to expel and exude confidence. And if not confidence, at least minimal fear. Look, we live in a time right now where fear and panic are driving folks. And when you include the massive disruption, not only of a virus, but also of work situations changing, people can become really, really uncomfortable. And it's our job as leaders to reduce that uncomfortability, make people more comfortable, so that they can, in essence, become more productive no matter where they are working from. All right, let's take a look at the second area, which is distractions. All right, and we're back. See? The board's all clean now. All right? Now we can get back and get started again. Well, the second thing that we have to look at is the number um, of distractions. 
So, when you work from home, or when you work remotely, or when you work anywhere that's not work, or quite frankly, when you work at work, the number of distractions that you have to manage is huge. Distractions at work come in a number of different ways. They come from other people. They come from random emails. And of course, the scourge of the modern workplace, unnecessary meetings. All right, so, I mean, look, these are three big ones right here. Distractions from other people, right? How do you handle that when you're in a remote environment? Well, as the leader, you can advise people, set up a room in your house where maybe you can't be distracted, right? Or where kids won't come in. Now that might be really hard if they don't have the facilities to be able to do that, as I mentioned before, but it is really important and really necessary to sort of reinforce that, well, work is work, even at home. Number two, random emails. This one is almost a ubiquitous, you know, in the modern workplace because we have utilized and we've outsourced email. Actually, we've outsourced all of our communications or the majority of our communications to email. Email is an interesting tool. In particular, people use it for texting. People use it in replacement for directly chatting with somebody. People use it in the space of other functions like Slack or instant messaging or direct messaging services. People find it quicker in the workplace to send an email than they do to have a face-to-face -face conversation. And when people are working remotely, the temptation to send more emails, not less, is huge. Also, the temptation to send emails that don't matter, which we do that at work all the time, grows over time because, well, yeah, I'm working at work, but I'm also not answering email immediately the way that I would be if you were sitting right in the cubicle next to me. So it's not just the number of emails, it's also random emails. And then number three, and we'll talk about types of meetings in a moment, but number three is unnecessary meetings. Look, I'll be honest, uh, meetings are, you know, something that I am a person who personally as a trainer and as a facilitator and even as a business owner don't always get happy about. I believe that most meetings should be 15 minutes and if we can't say it in 15 minutes, we probably shouldn't be having a meeting. It probably could be an email. But when you think about how people use meetings inside of work and most leaders don't, you realize that meetings are more than just about exchanging information. They're about status, they're about social structure, they're about power, they're about intimating to somebody else that I have influence and you don't. They're about politics, most meetings are. So for a leader, just a few things to consider. Number one, how do we help people who are working remotely eliminate or at least reduce the impact of other people. How do we help them and give them good ideas about how to do this? Number two, how do we eliminate random emails? This may mean for you as a leader, either not sending an email or sending an email that's so packed with information that it can't possibly wind up as a random email thread. And then number three, unnecessary meetings. We'll visit this in a moment, but how do we eliminate unnecessary meetings? Awesome. So again, we, we erased the board and we're back and we're gonna, we're gonna look at it this time. We're gonna look at our fourth, our third area, which is number of and types of meetings. So this one's really, really interesting. Um, this breaks down and it breaks down to two areas usually for leaders. Number one, what are the number of meetings you're having? So how many meetings? On a regular day, when you were thinking about as a leader with your team, how many meetings do you go in and out of? This can be as many as two or three, but I know people and you know people and you work inside of organizations where you can go from meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting to meeting in the course of a day and never get back to your desk and never feel like you've accomplished anything or gotten anything done. For those folks, 
when we go to a remote system, we have to keep in mind that the same standard can't be set. Primarily because the tools that we use to conduct these meetings, such as Zoom or Skype, and those are the two biggest ones with multiple other platforms underneath, like WebEx and others, currently in this time may not actually be able to handle the load from us having multiple meetings. Because it's not just us that's having them, it's also multiple other people. We may experience limited internet uptime. We may experience poor or slow connections. And the number one frustration that people have, and you can Google this or you can go on YouTube and see a bunch of different videos about, you know, sort of mocking what a remote meeting looks like in real life. Or you can see videos where people are lampooning or satirizing how remote meetings used to work. Now we're in a space where we have to have remote meetings because we can't gather in spaces together. And now it's not a joke or satirical, a bit of satirical humor. Now it's real life. So when you think about how many meetings, I want you to think about this question and think about it seriously. Could this meeting be an email? Would this meeting be better as an email? Would it be better for me to send a really concise, well-written email to my team? Would it be encouraging for me to tell the members of my team, hey look, now's the time for us to up our email game, for us to stop sending unnecessary emails and random ones that don't matter, and really making the emails that do matter really be meaningful. We, David Berkus, the organizational behaviorist, an organizational psychologist out of Oral Roberts University, has written a number of different things around this, and he talks about dividing emails into three categories. If you want to take a look, just Google David Berkus, and he'll be able to walk you through a lot of this. So, could this meeting be an email is a critical question for leaders to ask as we think about how many meetings we actually need to have during the course of a day. Because again, with multiple distractions at home, a change and a disruption in the work environment, the anxiety of current circumstances and current situations, and of course, with a lot of things coming at people all at once, managing and navigating meetings in a remote environment can become tricky. Now, after you think about how many meetings, then we have to think about who needs to be in the meeting. It used to be, in days where we could congregate everybody, we got everybody possible into the meeting, from the production manager all the way to the executive vice president. Or maybe if we have a large team, everybody on the team needs to have an all-hands-on-deck meeting. And maybe that works where we can all congregate together collectively as a group. But now, we're going to try to congregate collectively on these platforms, and like I said, the platform may not be able to handle the load, but then you might be running into people whose Wi-Fi isn't great at home, or whose mobile devices may not be able to allow them to connect, or who may not have the technical equipment or know-how to be able to handle these platforms, and they may have massive frustration. So this question of who needs to be in the meeting is absolutely critical. Can your meetings be kept small with just the mission-critical people that are needed to accomplish your project or keep things going? Mission critical. These are two key words that most of us as supervisors and as leaders and as managers may not necessarily have had to think about before, but we really have to think about now when we think about the scourge of meetings. And we don't want to transfer the scourge of the unnecessary meeting from real life into a digital environment when we're also asking people to feel, to, to feel, uh, un, to, not to feel, but to, uh, to be overwhelmed, right, and to not be overwhelmed, we're asking them to, to sort of go from these environments where they understood what was going on, and they understood the nature of the meeting, they understood why they were there, we're asking them to move from there to a spot where they may not feel as comfortable as they once did. Are these meetings mission critical? Who needs to be in them, and how many meetings are we having? And then, of course, what platform are we putting these meetings on? Here's something to know. As coronavirus, or COVID-19, continues to spread across our country, as there are shutdowns on, in theaters, in bars, in restaurants, as public gatherings begin to go away, and as the number of them continues to be reduced, 
as conferences and things like that continue to shrink. As more and more things go online, these three tools, along with a host of others, are going to be extremely popular. And the weight on these services of everybody all of a sudden using them all at one time is going to increase. So it might be really, really interesting for you as a leader to think about what are some contingencies if these platforms go down? If these platforms are no longer able to be used? If these platforms are no longer accessible to you in a work environment? What are the number and what are the types of meetings that you want to have as a leader with your team? Could this meeting be an email? And who are the most mission critical people that need to be in this meeting in order to make it a success? By the way, if the answer to this question is yes, this meeting could be an email, then maybe we need to think about emailing the mission critical people, keeping them on the email thread, and keeping everybody else out. And we're back. So we covered a number of people that you want to have working remotely. How to eliminate and navigate distractions. And of course, the number and types of meetings. Now finally, I want to talk about the number of ways you lead yourself as a leader. As a leader, these are some things that our followers are going to really be concerned about during this time. As we switch from working in groups with each other to social distancing and working in smaller groups, or maybe even working entirely from home or working remotely. The first question as a leader for yourself is this one. Are you scared and uncertain? Many leaders are scared right now. Many leaders are barely containing their own panic. I will tell you that as a leader, I do have feelings of fear myself. I lead a small team of people and I don't really know what's happening with them day to day. Not necessarily at a personal level, I do know that, but at a business level and at an organizational level. What's happening with the organization? Where are we going? How long are we going to be in the, engaged in this process? How much further down the road are we going to go? What are the economic and social ramifications that are going to reverberate into the second and third quarter from decisions we're making right now? Are you as a leader scared and uncertain? If you are, a couple of different points here, it's okay to acknowledge it. It's okay to tell your team that you're scared, that you don't really know what's going on, and that you're making contingency plans as best you can. It's also important to tell your team that you're responding rather than reacting. You're engaging rather than disengaging. Look, when stress happens, some people internally turtle, right? They, they curl up, right, into a little ball. Maybe not necessarily physically, but inside their heads, hoping that, against hope, that, you know, the storm will pass over and everything will be fine, pretty much unchanged on the other end. Other folks adapt to change by charging forward, willy-nilly, just sort of taking the ground and, and, and grabbing everything that they can. And those kind of folks can sometimes create more nervousness in their followers than they can a sense of confidence. The most effective leader, however, even for remote teams, is the kind of leader that engages in open communication and transparency, who uses not just the communication tools of, of email or Slack or video conferencing tools, but also uses the communication tools of their mouth and their emotions to engage with the people that are surrounding them in order not only to calm them down, but to calm themselves down. Are you scared and uncertain? Number two. Are you worried about your health? Look, if you've been to an area where there is an outbreak of novel coronavirus or COVID-19, or if you've been in contact with somebody who is in that area or, in, or who has visited those areas, if you are a person who is required to uh, take care of somebody who may have a high risk of getting this disease, if you are exposed to it and may be a carrier, but not necessarily sick yourself, if you have people at home, right, who are young and so far, Young people have been minimally impacted by this beyond the economic factors here, right? Yeah, the, the economic ones are huge, but the health ones, at least as of, as of this recording, have been very minimal. How many of those kinds of decisions are you making on a daily basis for yourself as a leader? How much information are you listening to and absorbing and being able to sift through in order to get to the right answers for folks? 
And of course, people are looking to you to decide what is going to be happening, and you may be dealing with your own health crises. You may be dealing with your own compromised immune system. You may be dealing with your own anxiety around, oh, am I going to be healthy? Am I going to get this? Am I not? Look, if you're worried about your own health, simple, simple task here, and I, I hate to mention it, but it seems obvious, see a doctor. As a leader, if, if you can't maintain your own health and you can't be assured of your own healthiness moving forward at a physical level, all of the mental and emotional stuff won't even matter. So check in with your doctor, see a doctor. I, I rapidly and I, I uh, rapidly and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, unambiguously, that's the word I'm looking for, encourage you to do that. And then the third question, do you have a plan? One of the interesting things about a plan is as we are seemingly careening from thing to thing, as we're seemingly moving from thing to thing, it seems like plans change every single day. When you're leading people remotely, it's really easy to send off a text message or send off a Slack message or send off, set up a Zoom meeting or send off an email on the fly. It's really easy to go from phone call to email to direct message to Zoom meeting and go back again and be in a churn, a tornado, right? without things calming down, without you being able to sit back, make a plan, and engage. There's a concept in adapting to change called the fat head and the long tail. And right now, what's happening in our culture, and you can look up both of those, the, the fat head concept and the long tail concept um, online. You could just Google it and you'll find it as a resource. You could also look up at the words of Peter Thiel, and you can look up at the, look up the words and the philosophies and the thoughts of Nicholas Nassim Taleb, who wrote a great book on this called Black Swan, and another great book about, about teams called Anti-Fragility that I would encourage you to check out. But the kind of thinking that we're engaged in right now is the, is the decline of fathead thinking. Fathead thinking is the kind of thinking that believes that, well, we'll always be working together. We'll always be able to congregate without social distancing. We'll always be able to engage with each other without necessarily having to work remotely. We won't have to necessarily think about that. That might be for people in big fancy industries like tech or some other place, but for us here in our name your town here or in our name your industry there, we can possibly make those kinds of switches. Yet when a public health crisis arises, something that we could not have expected, a black swan, we begin to make those decisions quite rapidly, quite reactively, and not responsibly. Do you have a plan? Even if it's a contingency plan. The people who you are following, the people who are remote working, need to know what your contingency plan is. This is where daily, steady communication, not driven by fear or panic, really becomes key. This is also where daily, steady, open and transparent communication becomes key for people to have confidence in their leaders, have confidence in the direction that they're going in, and have confidence that we're going to get through this safely and healthily together. The number of ways you lead yourself closes out what I wanted to say today for folks on the principles, some small ones, of leading remote teams effectively in a time of change. Look, as a leader, change is going to happen. Change is going to happen whether we anticipate it or whether we don't anticipate it. How we respond to change matters more than the change itself. How we engage with the people who are expecting us to have a plan, be heads up, be calm, those things really matter, not just in a time of remote working, but in a time where things are shifting and disrupted literally on the hour, every hour. As this global pandemic continues to spread and as people continue to be impacted, we're gonna to continue to make these videos. Like I said before at the beginning, Human Services Consulting and Training stands ready to help you through these times. Leadership development and our leadership development workshops are primarily targeted towards supervisors and managers in small and medium-sized businesses who want to lead better. And look, right now it may seem as though a leadership training might be a luxury that you don't really need. It might be that budgets are being cut and people are squirreling away and pulling back. It might be that training is not the thing that we're thinking about because it's not the most mission critical thing 
that we could possibly do right now with our dollars. And of course, we don't know what the impacts will be of COVID-19 and the coronavirus. We don't know what the impacts will be economically from the stock market to the banks to small businesses. We don't know what the social impacts will be and the social changes will be with social distancing and with moving people from larger groups to smaller ones and smaller ones and smaller ones. We don't know what those impacts will be and I understand that as a leader sometimes it's really easy to just be, again, reactive because everything's so uncertain right now. But I can tell you as the CEO and founder of Human Services Consulting and Training and as the lead facilitator, we stand ready to help you through this time. Please contact us. Check out our website. Let us talk to you about our workshop solutions that can be delivered remotely the same way we delivered this training today. They can be delivered online. They can be delivered video first. We can design these for any need that you might have for your people. We offer trainings from one hour to two hours, four hours or up to a day. We can integrate with Zoom, Cisco, Cisco's WebEx, and of course Skype to deliver these trainings to the mission critical people who need to think about leadership differently. And of course, I'm available to be connected with, so please check out all the ways you can connect with me and with the company below the doodly doop, as it says on YouTube, on the page. We're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, and we're on Twitter. Please reach out to me directly if you have any questions, comments, thoughts, or feedback. Thank you very much for watching today. Stay safe and stay healthy.